So, uh, this is the point at which we begin the dialogue a little bit. So, as I said, um, Don. As a student of the course now for several years, I'm, I'm having trouble reconciling, I think it's reconciling something. I'm having <coughs> trouble with even what is the question. And so if you well, can answer. In <laughs> <laughs> so I, I strive to operate from the principle of full responsibility, taking complete accountability for what happens, what is brought into my dream. Right. And I also, I made a note, because you said it in closing up before, in, in the, just the session, the only reality is God. There's only God. That's right. And I have a book called It's All God. You know, I kind of, I function from that space, too. Right. So then, then there's the dream. Mm -hmm. So then there's this dream that I'm creating, and God doesn't come into my dream. God doesn't impose this dream on me. No. So how does, how do I? As I hear certain things, I quickly go to question. Like I'm like, yeah, but it's all God, though, right? And it's a question I just ask myself, and I, I, I chase my tail on this. I go in a circle. So are you saying is God within the illusion? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're I'm asking? having trouble with what is the question. It's kind of like my mind is trying to find like, well, pick one, either or, pick one, and I, I go back and forth with this idea <coughs> of it's all God. It is. <laughs> to yeah, but it's a dream that I made up. Mm -hmm. You would be the graphic <laughs> that's, I, I, that's I, the conundrum. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a question about whether or not it's all God, which it is, or whether the fantasy dream world has any reality at all or not. It doesn't. God the dream does not, not imposed on me by God. Pardon? The dream is not imposed on me by God. No, the dream is not imposed by God. But it's it's your dream. dream. And it's all God. But no. 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 God no. has nothing to do with the dream. Oh. It's because so of, that's, it's a fantasy. The fantasy is reality. Fantasy it, is an illusion. What do you lose when you lose an illusion? Nothing. Right. And what is a fantasy? It's nothing. It's a fantasy. There's no truth in it. That it's all God, yes, right. right. And then God doesn't enter into the illusion. That's right. So, what do I do? What do I tell my mind when my mind is like. It's an illusion. <laughs> <laughs> it's where God is not. I mean, God is not in that because it is a fantasy. There's no reality to it. God doesn't know about your soap opera or your dream. There's no need to because it is a fantasy, it is a dream. No. Right, it's, and yes, that's true, it's nothing. It's literally nothing. It's literally no thing. It doesn't even exist, except as a fantasy, but uh, one good way to understand it is that there's no eternity in it, because it's a time thing. Okay, it's a time-bound concept. Fantasies happen in time. They have a sequence to them, they have a story to it. There's a past, present, and a future to it. None of that is real. So it's not real, it's not real. You're just entertaining the idea for the moment that there may be some sort of reality there. It's not. And that doesn't mean you might not be able to learn something from like, mythologies. You know, we can learn, we can understand what the basic story. We, we learn something, studying our, our dreams aren't real. But while our dreams are real, they, they can also be used as teaching devices for us to, to help us to understand and help us to wake up. But, there's no reality. <coughs> okay. So, yes. you just impose one other concept into what you just said. All right. There are no mistakes. I mean, no, no, accidents. no accidents. No There's no coincidence. So, right. so I'm going along in a seclusion. It's my dream that I created. Right. So I'm, I'm working this out. I'm right. taking my lessons. And there's no accidents. Right. So whatever seems to happen, even though I don't understand what you're asking, even within that context, there's still no accidents. <clears throat> so when you literally have an accident, it's not an accident. Okay, yeah, Monica. Mona. Mona. That's Sorry, okay, Mona. Okay. 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 Um, my thought about what she just said was that God. <clears throat> it's all about okay. We're having this dream, this illusion, this fantasy, 
but is God in that? No, but God can be in that. If there is a perception that I have about something that's judgmental or negative or traumatic or anything negative about the fantasy and the dream that I am experiencing, I can just say three little words, God, please you know, help me, to turn that perception that I have that might be negative, quote, negative, about this illusion and to bring God into it and to make it something of love, to say, God, your love, let me experience this with you, helping me to turn my you know, perception of pain and fear into a perception of love. Right, and then that the way God is in the is, is has made this fantasy into a perception. I don't know. <laughs> that's what a miracle is. A miracle is a process by which you change the mind, and rather than continue to be caught in the fantasy dream, you see the reality that lies beyond, beyond it. Okay. As fear. Oh, also. Um, fear? Yeah. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. No, I'm yeah. sorry, Kim. Uh, just on the same topic, this it, to realize what that is, that God is real and the only reality. And we are all aspects of that whole mind, which is God. This, every single thing happening that causes distress or upset or um, everything that has this fear and guilt, everything that has to do with bodies and this appearance of separate will, this whole thing is happening because I, as, as John said, had this little thought that I was going to entertain, doing it myself. Thank you, God, but no thanks. I'm going to be my own creator. And every single one of us is part of that mind of what is called God's Son, which is the extension of God. And we're still the truth. The God only creates the eternal. Everything of time passes away and disappears forever and will not even be remembered. And that's why, you know, it's called a dream, because it disappears completely. Yet, we, the dreamer, are part of God and eternal. And in that sense, God is here in the dream. And in that sense, I am using the extension of creative mind, which is God, to dream hell. And what the Course is doing is waking me up to the responsibility, as John said, that it is I who am creating this disaster for myself, that everything I projected out here, which is all conflict, which is all separate will and experience of limitation, mortality, birth and death, what a doomful situation. From the moment you're born into that body, the clock is ticking and you're gonna die. And nobody wants to think about that. People wanna say that's a negative idea, but it's just, it's a fact of human being and thank God, as John said, our reality is only spirit. And that's the release from fear, is the full realization of that. So I don't know if that's maybe a little more understandable that's good, than thank you, that, that we're really not separate from God, but it, it needs to be realized. And then we can we can be here and dream more responsibly. We can join our will yeah. with God and create with the love that we are. And that's the happy dream that the happy course dream. talks about. The happy dreams were the ones who awaken from the dream. Yes. Right. My concern is with the, in the chapter we read, uh, coming in uh, about physical impulses and, oh, and yeah. uh, yes, miracle, miracle impulses. And, and uh, it seems to me, you know, I've been studying for a few years myself on my own, about eight years, and, and uh, um, I'm constantly dealing with physical impulses. Sure. And even if I walk down the street and people are moving, it's my anger, my this, my that, mm -hmm. you know, on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And I don't, how do you, how do you, and then I'm, my suspicion is that at some point, <coughs> my suspicion, I hear people like you and other people that, and I read other people, that you begin to experience everything differently and I'm still I'm still I'm still right here in the body sure. and I don't and, and I feel like a lot of times I get into uh, you know the, the intellectual play of ideas I got a new concept a new way of looking at things but it doesn't it's not home it doesn't I don't feel like it I still feel like I'm dealing with physical impulses and not miracle impulses and that's good question um, so in this section, it talks about, and I could turn right to it, but I'm not doing it really quick. 
um, physical impulses are misdirected miracles impulses, right? Actually, the first, when that first came through, Helen wrote down sexual. Um, now, that was corrected by Jesus to say physical. Now, on the bodily level, <clears throat> we, all, we have a lot of physical impulses, right? One of those would be the sexual impulse. Just one of them. There's this, we are very, again, not only trapped in time, we're trapped in these bodies. And then the body can get attracted to all kinds of, food is the most obvious one, right? I mean, there's nobody, nobody here that doesn't have to deal with that issue. But all of the physical impulses, and but then that can, if that gets overwhelming for us, temptation, so we all have these temptations that come along, right, that pull us. One of the things that happens as you do the process of the course is that you will find that those impulses are falling away, that it's, it's lessening the, the need, there's less need on the physical impulse level to get caught in any of those kinds of alcohol, drug, any kind of addiction, right? So that you, because you see, you just see that you don't need it. And you see that it's a distraction. There are so many distractions that this world has for us, especially on the physical level. Uh, not just the things that are possible addictions, but thrills. Uh, for the bodies, you know, like we want to go places and do things to give us the stimulation, skiing, you know, whatever it is, you know. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with skiing. <laughs> but you think about it, it's just that what's skiing? It's a body that's skiing, that's engaged in having as much physical stimulation that's going on for it as it, as it possibly can. So I just want to look at that and, and find the freedom from it. Freedom isn't that I don't, I don't stop eating, I don't stop having sexual relationships or whatever, but I don't let it guide my life. I don't, as I said earlier, I think as you do the course, you'll find that there's, as more and more awareness comes up, there's less and less need to be caught in any kind of thing that's going to pull me down, affirming the fact that I am a body, you know, because you are not a body. So we're progressively getting, the, the Gnostics realized this a couple of thousand years ago, but they got a lot of mistaken interpretations as what that meant. You know, some of them would put down the body, flagellating themselves with it. Well, that just made the body more real. You know, that's just exaggerating the situation. So be pleased as you find, notice how often the word temptation actually appears in the forest. Now, often those temptations are towards some, towards some sort of physical thing, and you just, you don't need to go there. It just really, it's, it's not painful, it's not difficult, and it's a great, provides a great sense of freedom, tremendous freedom. I had a friend once who, who told me he'd been an alcoholic, and okay, he said that he didn't realize the incredible clarity of mind that he could come to, and this was weeks after he dropped it. <laughs> There was this whole new mind that was there available for him. And that, that mind is there available for everyone all the time. There's a lot of distractions out there in this world. This world was made to distract us. Yes? Thanks, John. Uh, I understand that the body is, isn't, uh, doesn't matter to the spirit. But, you know, if I'm walking on the street or in the subway and a homeless person asks me for a dollar, do I remind them that it's his dream and not mine? Okay. Keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not. I don't mean to be facetious, but what I'm asking is, what happens to compassion? Yeah, yeah. Well, you don't. You know that the body still has those kind of needs. And no, if you you do what you can, if you if you have the resources and the wherewithal, you help. You do whatever helping you can, wherever you can, whenever you can, whenever you can. Whenever you can. You know, Even mean, though this is all a dream, it doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, doesn't make sense. And it's not real. And no, the money I'm giving you isn't real. No, no if, if, if a guy still needs to, to eat tonight, yeah. and you can help him to eat tonight, you know, help him to eat tonight. Can I just add that if you came into your awareness, then it became part of your dream? 
Well, but in New York, it's kind of hard to avoid. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. but that, but that yeah. is part of your dream. Go to Calcutta. Yes. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe it is part of my dream. I don't know. Is it part of yours? Absolutely. Okay, if, so I mean, if, if it's dream. in my awareness yeah. and it's in my experience, then it's part of my, what the dream that I'm creating. <coughs> New York is part of my dream and everything that comes with it. We both have our individual dream and a collective dream. And the collective dream is what's going on here at the moment. The collective dream is walking down the street in New York City. It's driving in the highway. It's whatever it is that's going on that we're sharing with that particular group of people at that particular moment. And there may be some overlaps there, or there may not be any overlaps at all. It's just, I'm just sort of just passing each other in the landscape. Stan? Thank you, John. Um, I'm, I'm not in New York, so uh, by the grace of uh, generosity of John here, let me uh, be here today. But I... Can you speak up, please? I'm <clears throat> sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about perception, and it says in the text there, we only perceive what we want. But right. my experience of it is there's a lot of pain in the world that I don't want. Yeah, how did... How, how did I come about that I want something or I don't want? Right. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, but you just said there's a collective, there's a collective ego. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when all right, but let me finish here first. Um, there's going to look like a lot of stuff that we don't want. That's going to happen to any one of us at, at any different point along the road. The question is how. How plugged am, am I into whatever it is that I'm seeing? So one of the things that I want to look at is, do I have aversions to what's going on? Or do I have attractions to what I'm Look at your attractions, look at your aversions, right? So, no, and what we're coming down to is no attraction, no aversion. I mean, it's just, you just let it be what it is. It's really pretty simple. Again, a lot of the people be who they are. No, no, it's not that simple. It's not that simple. <laughs> no, it isn't because of the fact that you're supposed to look at everything because we're supposed to go with empty arms up to heaven. So that means you have to look at everything within you. And if you, let's say, I look at a, a newspaper or I read the news, and I don't want to look at it. I really don't. Now, am I avoiding that? Because I have to look at it. And I'm saying to myself, well, am I avoiding that? Or shouldn't I look at it? But I don't want to look at it. I don't like it. I don't like like violence. I've never liked violence. I don't sure. go to violent movies. Yeah. Now I'm saying to myself, well, I'm not looking at it. Is that correct? Because I'm, you know, it's very confusing, Frank. Well, what, what, the difference doesn't make you look at it or you don't look at it. But you have to acknowledge it, don't you? Don't you have to? Doesn't uh, well, Dr. There. Bobnick we're say that? It, we're not saying it's not part of the experience of my experience or your experience in the world, but if it's the connection to it, how connected am I to that? How plugged in am I to that? How important is it to me? Or can I just let it go? It doesn't mean you don't help. You do whatever you can if you can do something, but otherwise, what? But looking at, a let's say, the news. Right, the news. And we have, you know, all the time, it all just bombards you. And you don't want to look at the news. Now, am I saying I'm then avoiding don't look that? look at the news. You don't need to look at the news. No, you don't. You don't have to look at the news. No. Nobody says you got to turn that on. You can either leave it alone, or you can turn it on and watch it dispassionately. Which means that that doesn't mean that you don't have sympathy and empathy and caring and concern about whatever it is that's going on, but you're not letting it upset you and drive you crazy because of whatever it is. We can see tragic stuff every day. It doesn't yeah. mean that you become cold or hard to it either. But you're also supposed to have compassion for the victim. Yes, of course. And the victimizer. You're supposed to have yes. compassion for the victimizer. Especially the victimizer it's very dis because we don't usually have passion for the victim. That's right. So that's very difficult to do. How do you reach that point where you're going to have compassion for a victimizer. Well, it takes a stretch, doesn't it? You know, when when um, the bombing in Boston back in, was it April? Yeah. Something like that, right? So the day, the Sunday after that, I had to give a talk at a church. 
and I scrapped whatever it was that I had to talk about, and I just did an impromptu talk called The Boy in the Boat. And <clears throat> I asked people to imagine what was going on in the mind of the boy in the boat. Okay, so he has just killed a number of people, including a young boy, he's maimed all these other people, he's wounded himself, uh, he's hurt, he's being chased down by the largest posse in the world, it's ever been assembled to catch somebody that's going on in this guy's mind and, and all the projections that are being placed upon him. And then I asked the people, how does God see this? And how God, how God sees this, that this is his child. As much as any other child of God is, you know, who's obviously made a huge mistake and got into a lot of trouble and will no doubt spend the rest of his life in jail or something because of it, but from the right perspective, it's still possible to love under any conditions, whatever it is that's going on. That's the challenge, is to be able to, you know, to make that stretch and to do what you can do. The Course asks us to do a lot of stretching in that sense, spiritually speaking. But you can do that. There was another hand right here. Uh, yeah, hi. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm there's a question that's pondered me ever since I started the course. I had a little bit of clarity about it a couple of years ago, and it's, it's left me now. And it's the statement that, you know, it says through right-minded perception and through receiving miracles, we can indeed collapse time. Right. And help further the process of our awakening. But then it states in the Manual for Teachers and also somewhere on the course that the script is already written, and the time is already set for our <laughs> awakening. So if there's a time for me that's set, and the script is already written, mm -hmm. and I'm just playing out my part in it, how is it that a miracle can collapse time if the time is already set? <laughs> I think, you, I think that, that you can only see that backward. By seeing it backward, I mean that once you get to the point where whatever the event was that it occurred, let's say the miracles occurred, a miracle speeds up time. But the miracle speeds up time because the moment that the release occurs, the, the release that's happening in my mind actually reflects all the way back. So when I'm forgiving, for example, I'm not just forgiving that person that I'm thinking that I'm forgiving, I'm forgiving all of the grievances and all the hurt feelings that I have because I realize that that's the right choice to make. So it's not just one one person that's being forgiven, it's the whole idea that I, would, that I had a grievance in the first place is what the, the forgiveness is about. Or that I could have a grievance against anyone for anything, for any reason, at any time. Now as I move further, I, I think along in the spectrum, so to speak, and I look back, that's why the past as well held no mistakes, then you see that was absolutely perfect. You know, that was exactly the way it was supposed to happen. Even though, even those events, which you say to yourself at the time that they're happening, I would never have written this, I would, when I had cancer, I said, I know, I did not write cancer in my script, you know. But obviously I did, because I had cancer. So, but, but then, there was also a healing, which was really pretty nice. So I think that the, the, the further you move along, or not, the, along isn't the right word, uh, the higher you get, it's, it's a vertical rather than a horizontal right. axis, right. right? So that's again about the thing about being above the battlefield. Right. So as I move into a vertical, in fact, look at the back of the, on the back of your sheet today, I stuck a, a little chart, and yeah. for those who are watching on um, YouTube on the website, turn to the last page. <clears throat> Can you see the last page, the chart? Okay. So what I was, what I'm suggesting in that chart is there's one sheet that doesn't have it. Remember the last one I did? This one. You must have got it. Okay. Look on it. Um, at the bottom I have this whole experience of being a body and this there's a straight path, 
a narrow gate that can lead us directly home. And any time we get like close to that straight path and the narrow gate, that's where the holy instant is, that's where the now experience is. If, if I get into that, I kind of speed up this whole process. I get to know, is it at the top, eternity now, truth, perfect happiness, perfect love. This is where convergence occurs, grace, the narrow gate. But we all kind of wander around in this life journey process. We're going here, going, making that, going, going, I'm going to go through this divorce, and I'm going to go through this bankruptcy, I'm going to go through this. But it's all designed, really, to get me back to the center. I'm constantly, always trying to get, and the more of these blocks I remove to the awareness of love's presence, the more I'm aware of this centered, this centered state, which is taking me directly home to God again. And it's wonderful when you have these, that's why I said revelations earlier, our whole experience, our whole instant. And sometimes they can occur under really pretty bleak conditions. By bleak conditions, I mean um, that you somehow, you know, that it, it's going to be okay. You know, whatever it is, that this, this difficulty I'm going through, um, God really is in charge. And it, it, it really is going to work out. I really am going to get my way home again. I just have to I keep that hold to that memory until I can. That's what grace is again. What talks about grace is that experience of, of the recognition that I'm already home, actually. The spirit is in. In fact, this is a quote that we have on this sheet today. See, see that's, uh, that's what confuses me, though. It's, it's already over. Right. The dream's already over. I'm right. just reliving this hope. Being in this holy instant, I, it, it makes perfect sense that I can sure. speed in the process instead of wavering into the past into the future. I, if I'm staying in the present moment, I can further this process. But exactly. once I get to the gate, per se, is my process what gets me there, or is I do I go through the gate because it's my time set? So, like, this is a well, if I understand your question, is I both the truth? Both. Yeah, and you're on the way. And okay. Once you get to the end of the gate, you it's see that there was no other way. It's a confusing. Other questions? Yes. John. I just wanted to make a point about that. John, yeah. um, because it comes up, and I think about it a lot, about well, how do I forgive the boy in the boat or somebody I see in the news? Right. And, um, you know, with what we were reading today, there's just, I hope I don't take it out of context, but it says as long as one single slave remains to walk the earth, my release is not. And so for me, that just brings it back down to it's not forgiving what this person has done. It's my forgiving of, of how I've seen this. Exactly. And that as long as I'm still seeing it with my human eyes and my human judgment, I am still enslaved. Good. All right. So let's talk a little bit about how the whole forgiveness process works. Okay. The way the forgiveness process works, when it really works, when it really, really happens, and you let something go, at that point there's an incredible thing that happens. And that incredible thing that happens is that you realize, oh my God, I'm the one who's forgiven. I'm the one who's forgiven. Because nothing really happened, except in my mind. In my mind, something happened. I saw something, I perceived something, I made a judgment about something that happened. My mind, the ego mind in this case, said that's wrong or that's bad or that shouldn't happen or whatever it is. Now that I've released this and now that I've let this go, I'm the one who's free. I'm the one who's liberated. That's what's exciting about it. And but by the way, when you when you're liberated and when you're free, you also, from a, from a higher standpoint here, right, you see that it's all liberated, it's all free. That the whole thing did, as a matter of fact, is over. That everyone is liberated as well. Not just not just you. Because you're part of this whole spectrum. That's why you have this wonderful these wonderful insights where you get it, you get that it's all already cleared. 
it's, it's already done. This, in fact, is it, that there's a point in which it says the world was over long ago. It was over long ago. That's why we're talking about rehearsing it and going back in our minds to show it hasn't, like some sort of bad flashback, as though it hasn't been ended. But when you get to the end of time, there's a line that talks about the carpet just sort of rolls up, and you see, it's, it's just it's, when it's over, it's over. Which means it's completely over. Which means that there's nothing to forgive anymore. But I, there's no forgiveness in heaven. How can you have forgiveness in heaven? Yeah. <laughs> that would be impossible. There's no healing in heaven. There are no miracles in heaven. Because what do you need a miracle for? What do you need forgiveness for? Once it's done. This is what this world is. So this world is a place where we've got a lot of forgiveness to do and a lot of healing to do because we think we have to, to do it. This book is this wonderful process which helps us to, to see as actually that it is done and it is over. Then you can get to live peacefully regardless of what's going on externally in the world. In your home or in the, the greater community. It doesn't make any difference where you And you can actually get to a point which is really nice where you can laugh at the whole thing. You, just, you, you laugh at the silly ego. Remember that, that line? Into a journey where all was one, uh, there crept a tiny mad idea. And this tiny mad idea is this still the same idea that we're, we keep holding on to in this world. I wish the Son of God remembered not to laugh. We should have, this is a stupid, ridiculous idea. Now, a stupid, ridiculous idea is it's possible to be separate from God. It's not possible to be separate from God. But just for a moment, you, me, us, we, humanity, mankind, entertain the thought that it was possible to be separate from God. It's not possible. And once I realize that, I'm, I'm, I'm liberated, and so is everyone along with me in my mind, which is the only thing that there is, <laughs> is the mind. That's why a very important uh, concept in the Course is it's repeated over and over again, and this is a point of real liberation, it, is that there's only one mind. Where, where I said before, there's only one of us here. You know that great line from the end of lesson uh, 52, I think I quoted last time we were together, which is, would I not rather join the thinking of the universe? Think about that. There's a kind of thinking which is the thinking of the universe. That's the only time this phrase appears in course is in that one sentence. Would I not rather join the thinking of the universe than to continue to cherish, or that's many of you me flip the toy and get exactly right, my own. Here, can you believe that? Just flip the toy. What are your chances of that? What are your chances of that? Okay. Would I not rather join the thinking of the universe than to obscure, that's what I was looking for, than to obscure all that is real in mind with my pitiful, meaningless, private thoughts. Okay, my pitiful, meaningless, private thoughts are all those fantasies that you're talking about, all those fears and all those anxieties and all that whoa, 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 stuff that's going on that's keeping me trapped and in a place of isolation. And isolation is not a, a, it's not an, it's a place of depression. And, and because it's a place of depression, it's not a fun place to be. That's, see, this is very scary to the ego. It's very scary to the ego because it means if I let this all go, then I'm a goner. I'm not going to do it today, but some some other day when I'm up to the whole first hour, I'm going to do there's no <coughs> you. <laughs> but you, I mean, there, there, there's literally no. There's no John Mundy, there's no Dan, there's no Larry, there's no... That's all the fantasy. And the ego, that scares the hell out of the ego, because then it looks like, well, there's no... Who are you talking to? Right? No, no, me, then, you know, what? what is there? Well, there's this one beautiful experience, it's called God. Uh, or called oneness, or wholeness, or completeness, or perfect happiness, or synonyms of eternity, heaven. These are all synonyms, it's really love, life. It's actually life. That's the, the thing that we don't 
kind of get that you think you're going to lose your life, but as Jesus says in the Gospels, whoever loses his life will find it. You know, whoever loses the, the illusion that he has an individual life is going to find out that the life that's really a life that is so far beyond this that, that an illustration I might use is if an ant were walking across the floor here, and, and assuming this was possible, and the ant could stop and look up and see me standing here, he would have no idea what it was looking at. Right? Because it would just be this giant thing there, right? <laughs> well, it's it's like that. And it's it, you give up being a body and a person and then the merging of multiple mind is such a step beyond anything that we can even imagine with our tiny little ego-oriented minds. And we're so afraid of letting that go to have this incredible experience in the thinking of the universe, and yet that's the experience that's there for us. And it occurs through this way, again, of course, has a lot of emphasis upon sharing. It really comes to sharing. And the way we experience that is we experience it through love. We experience it through love in any time that we are genuinely loving. But the thing about being genuinely loving is that we're also letting go. By that, I mean, we're letting go of any projections that we would place onto any other. And what happens is that in that we are seeing in the other, rather than something we're throwing on them, we're seeing their innocence. We're seeing the wholeness. We're seeing the completeness, which is already there. And always, that's again, again, what happens when you fall in love. It's what makes falling in love kind of nice. You see the wholeness, you see the, the innocence, and it's so attractive that that's what we're falling in love with. Huh, let me stop. Other, yes, sir. And you are, what's your name? I'm Tom. Tom. Tom's new, right? Yes, I uh, actually been studying the course of work for about an hour. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's that time thing. It's oh. starting to happen. Oh. And, uh, and I, I, you know, I feel that I'm a you know, spiritual being having a human experience right now. And uh, I come from my short time on earth to know, feel like begin to know God a little bit. And you talk about falling in love, how you begin to get that sensation for a moment, a, a small sensation of completeness you'll get to experience that uh, truth at the end of the day where your minds converge, convergence and the truth. So falling in love here is that sensation. And my question is, where my spirit emanated from, where it came from, did it leave that completeness, that wholeness? And that's really my question. Yes, great question. Somebody asked a very similar question to that um, last time. So, it looks that way. It looks as though it left. That's what we call this whole ego phenomenon. And when the lady asked that the last time, a little bit of a reiteration of what I said. On one level, and it's the main level, it never actually ever happened. So it never happened. You never left God, you never left home. That's why this whole thing's a dream. Now, because it looks like we did, so we need to talk about it as though it did. The reason why it happened, the answer to the reason why it happened is never a good answer. It's never a good answer because the moment you give the, the answer, then the person will say, yeah, but why that? And why would we do that? The, the answer is that we left out of arrogance. We, we left out of this kind of the hubris. We left out of, out of pride. Again, you can't really do it, but it sure looks like we did, because we do have these bodies. And the bodies, the egos, and we do have these egos. But that's what, that's what of course, is so hard to, to grasp, I think, because it's, a, the, it's all an illusion. The, the body is an illusion. 
here's a, a quote, I, I'll probably do this every time. Not for a single instant does the body exist at all. It has no existence, and the proof of the fact that it has no existence is the fact that it is ephemeral. So only that which is eternal is real. The only thing which is eternal is the mind, God, love, truth. That's what's real, but that is, and we know that it's true. We know that that's true inside us, but we've got so damn much obvious information about bodies and world and time and all that, that that's why it's difficult for us to figure this thing out. That's why what, what's required here is a lot of two of the most important characteristics of a teacher of God. This described in the manual of the teachers. Number one is trust. Okay, so what we're trusting is we're trusting that what we believe to be true really is true. That, that there really is a God, there really is heaven, there really is this place, there really is this mind, which is so far beyond my little ant mind that I can't even begin to, to, to quite grasp it, and yet there's, it, the, the, the Course says you cannot lose your soul, or your mind, your spirit. You can't lose it. You can't really lose it. But you can lose your awareness of it. So what we're all doing here, and why you really love the Course in America, is that we are struggling to, rem to not only remember that, but to hold that memory. I mean, to hold it every second of every day. And we were holding it in the face of what are sometimes incredible temptations, the incredible temptations of the body, to get involved in bodily stuff, to let the body the ego body rule, and the ego body does rule if I've got an addiction going on, or I'm overeating, or, or something like that. Uh, it's, it's the temptation to believe the news as being real. And, and, and in some level, it's always, there's always been the news, <laughs> and it's always been bad news. And especially if you study history, and you see there's a lot of a lot of bad news. We actually live in a probably pretty good time right now. There's a little bit less bad news than, I mean, it may not look that way, but you wouldn't have been around during one of the wars, the Second World War, the Civil War, the any war. You wouldn't have been in a lot of bad times to have been having an experience, and then there have been a lot of challenges as to what the hell the meaning of this whole thing was. It wouldn't make any sense at all. Right? Nazi Germany, a terrible place to, to have been. So there's all these temptations that are just going to keep coming up. And, and so I look at all the temptations and I say, no, thank you. you know, I know, there, what, how did the whole Course in Miracles get started? The whole Course in Miracles got started when Bill Thetford turned to Helen Schuchman and said, there must be another way. Well, we all, I think we all believe that. We all believe there must be another way. And this 500,000 words here <laughs> describes to us what that other way is. And, and as you read this, it keeps having this folly about the Course. It rings true. It rings true. It rings true. It just keeps actually, the deeper you get into it, the more, the more it rings true. And so you know it's there. And so what you do is we study this. I was listening to a CD on the Kabbalah the other day as I was driving, and one of the observations that the speaker made was he was talking about the Kabbalah is a study. We study the Kabbalah. We read the Kabbalah, we write about the Kabbalah, we talk about the Kabbalah, we, we share it with each other, we try to move deeper into the understanding what this is. Well, it's the same thing with the Course. We study the Course. My teacher, Another, uh, Joseph Rabbi Gilman, uh, here in New York City, his love was the Kabbalah. It was a, their, and my love was the Course. But they're both going in the same direction. They're both trying to get us to the truth. And they're both describing a process. That's what the Atonement is. The Atonement is also in this chapter we didn't talk about. 
and see even more in chapter two, so we'll talk more about that next time. But let's just say what the atonement is very good. The atonement is the process by which we engage in this, if you will, cleaning of the house. Uh, the removing all the cloud, removing all the blocks through the awareness of Allah's foot. So we're constantly engaged in this and so we get greater clarity. And greater clarity because I'm always getting this junk out of the way. Which then gets me closer and closer to not that I'm home, you know, but the good news is I know I'm on the way home. That's the good news. You know, the good news is, using that chart here, that I know that my foot is on the path. And the door may not be open for me yet, but uh, I know I'm going in the right direction. That's the good news. The good news is that I'm going in the right direction. I think we should not be conceited about this, but uh, those of us who are students of the Course in Miracles uh, should be grateful. Uh, for the fact that we have found a path that it's, that works. You all probably know that traditional Christianity, um, not just in this country, but all around the world, even worse in Europe than it is here, is dying incredibly rapidly. It's, it's like there's been a 1% loss in church attendance in the United States since the mid-60s per year. There's like Back in the 60s, about 50% of the people in the United States were studying, were studying, were observing church, going to church. It's 17% now. From 50 to 17% in the last 60 years. That's just a tremendous <laughs> drop. And, and why? Because it doesn't answer the questions. It provides community, which is a very nice thing, which is why some people are still there. The community part of it, is a very important part of you know, the spiritual communities. Important to have a spiritual community. But often those spiritual communities wind up becoming soap operas in and of themselves, in which some people find that they can't. I had this guy tell me once, I used to retreat at New Mallory Alvey, which was a, a Trappist uh, abbey in Iowa. And I used to live in Missouri and even after that. And um, so that's a spiritual community. I was giving a talk at a church in Indianapolis, uh, and the fellow who was the custodian of the church who came to my lecture was talking to me after. He says, "You know, I used to be a Trappist monk." He says, "And one day, I put on my work clothes under my robe, and I walked to the front door, and I stood, and I looked across at the cornfields." and I started walking, and I never took back. <laughs> because what happened inside that abbey was it became an incredible sopapa. Nobody could stand the abbot. It was all about the abbot and the dictator of abbot. And you know, they had to do what he said, and you know, it's just like another kingdom, right? Another kingdom. And he wanted to just walk away from this insane kingdom. So we're just walking away from an insane kingdom, whatever it is. But however it is defined, can be defined even in a spiritual community. That was a very long response. But, <laughs> um, oh, we here. What, I don't know any questions. Hi, my name's Mary. I'm, I'm trying, my head is spinning because I'm fairly new to studying, practicing the lessons of the Buddhists. And, um, and I do, I, you know, studied some Buddhism, but I never liked it. Speak up, please. Yeah, yeah. For some Christian thought, and I've studied some Buddhism. I guess the question would be then how to embrace, I mean, how does the Course want to embrace this form of existence? Because I, I don't, when I hear illusion, I mean, I understand illusions and the, maybe it's semantics, but to be able to embrace this form so it's not a negative experience. So, I mean, that I think is what Christ was trying to do too, to bring some divinity to the body as well as the experience here. and some resurrection power in our life here and after. Um, so I don't know, what does the Course want to achieve as far as being here and embracing this life and this form and this creative and this beauty sure. that's on this planet? Because along with the hells, there's a lot of beauty and yes, wonder. Absolutely. All right. 
Okay, good question. And so, so your main word there was embrace. Uh, but to, so that, I mean, like, you know, Buddhism, you, this is samsaric existence, so you become enlightened so that you can choose rebirth to come back to help other people be free from samsaric existence. Maybe in Christianity, um, you would accept the Holy Spirit to then, um, you know, be empowered in your life now and to help other people and to, to, to experience God's love and to be compassionate and to make the world a better place. So what, in the Course of Miracles, we want to break down the blocks to the experience of love and the illusions. Yet, does this have to be a complete illusion, meaning that, that I cannot, can I, can I not enjoy this form of existence? And yeah, sure. Okay, so, yeah. yeah, good question. So yeah, we want to make the best of it uh, that we can. Um, two of my favorite words here would be love and life. And so we want to find as much love here as we can. And the way that we find that love, of course, is by giving it. Um, and the Course says very clearly that you will be sent all the people that you need to, to work with. You don't have to go on some sort of missionary effort to find out where the work is, because they'll, they'll show up for you every day. Uh, sometimes they're called uh -huh. husbands and wives, and <laughs> bosses, and uh, you know, people, people like that. But, and so this is where my lesson is. So I work with these, with these folks. There's a lot of forgiveness opportunities that, that presented within family complex, for example. And I'm going to do the best job that I can about loving whomever that is, whatever that situation is, which is also another word that I really like a lot is uh, life. Uh, one of the definitions of God that appears in the Course, we, we said the first session that you can't define God, which you can't define God, but <clears throat> one of the definitions of God that appears in the Course is that God is life. Okay. So we want to move as deeply into, into being alive as we can. So being alive means that I don't have a lot of my conscious stuff going on, that I'm not subject to obsessive behavior, to compulsive behavior, to addictive behavior, that, which then enables me to be free. And, and the freer I am, the more I can give, the more I can love, the more alive I am, the more in love I am, the more in love I am, the more alive I am, the more alive I am, the more I can love, and it's just, in that sense it just keeps getting better. Because we just keep enjoying this whole experience. It's not because there's anything that I can do in terms of money or travel or anything like that. It's just my whole experience should become progressively peaceful, number one, and blissful. Joyous is a very important word. Uh, joy is one of the basic characteristics of a teacher of God, that they're joyous. Because of what opens up for you in this process of, of opening up to life. You just, you know that you're taking care of, you know everything's going to be okay. That's very, very exciting. So, it's simple. It's a simple matter of living and loving. It sounds like, it sounds like very simple. It sounds like a preacher, right? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there this one? Oh, Billy. Yeah, when you leave here and then you go to work, you're in an anger type environment. You're trying to keep this course of air attitude. Speak up a little bit, Bill. I think you're objective. They project, project the anger towards you. Like you say, well, on, our, on our job, we have like a lot of anger for some of the guys that are not happy. Right. And you're trying to keep your peace. Right. And anger is like that ego, like you said, the insanity right. of ego. Sometimes I wonder how to deal with it. That's my question. Oh, of course. Yeah. But I'll repeat the question because I know that you didn't understand. So he says that I find his job, uh, he experiences a lot of anger, okay, and uh, a lot of attack, right? Do you mind if I tell what you do? I'm actually a shop student. A shop student? I'm a shop student. You don't have to deal with all the time. Oh. There's a lot of unfairness, prejudice, you know, right. anger. Right. So they're not trying to keep no anger. But you still experience it in your environment. Right. No anger toward you, but it's happening around you. Right. So again, you, we just we just look at it. And, and we just see it. And of course, we, we resist the temptation to get involved in it. We resist the temptation to throw sand around. To, to, to get involved in any kind of projective behavior that's going on at all. So sometimes, you know, it's not a lot of fun. 
I mean, sometimes it's not a lot of fun being here in this world, especially if you're dealing with a screaming child or a screaming teenager or a screaming mate or a, you know, whatever it is that you're dealing with that, that seems to be off the wall or losing it. But you don't have to lose your peace. That's the good news. You know, there's no reason for you to lose your peace just because, and if you see the temptation to do that, then, actually my teenage daughter told me this, uh, better than anybody else, but she's now 26, almost 27 years old, so thank God that period passed. But uh, the teenage, the teen years were really pretty, pretty difficult years. And what I realized in that process of it is that when the temptation came up, and the temptations came up, I mean the temptations to say the wrong thing, I mean to say something that, that to hit back with words, right? I knew that at that point, when especially it was getting really heavy, what I had to do was to turn around and to walk away. Go to another, go to my office and close the door and wait. Uh, wait for her to, for some sense of peace of mind, to come, wait for some peace of mind to come back my way. And, and it will, you know, it just it takes a little time. I, I told you the thing about Joe Walter Taylor last time, didn't you, about the, you, know, you all know about Joe Walter, Joe Walter Taylor, about the book, uh, The Stroke of Insight. Oh. Well, she was being interviewed on Oprah a couple of months ago, and she still is involved in, in neurological research. And she was talking about how that they had discovered that if you have, for example, a, a terrible tantrum two thing situation going on, <clears throat> if you could just kneel down and put your arms around that for 20, 90 seconds, a minute and a half, that it would go away. Well, that that's the same idea with the, the, the terrible twos tantrum that's going on in my head. So if I, I just <clears throat> take some patience, so I just want to take a little bit of time and just hold the lovingly that piece of insanity that seems to be coming, it doesn't have to come out of my head, you, know, <clears throat> you don't want it to go to the, here, to the tongue the throat and the tongue. If it goes there, then <clears throat> you know, you're in trouble, but <clears throat> it's not bad enough that it gets into the mind, but I just hold it in my mind. I just sort of, that's why I actually talk about the boy in the boat. You know, I said, well, you know, what if somebody could hold the boy in the boat? You know, what if somebody could love the boat? What does that, what does the boy in the boat mean more than anybody else? I mean, more than anything else, he needs, which he's not going to give. But somebody just kind of, hold him and say, it's okay. I mean, I don't, it looks all really insane right now. The world is falling apart right now, but somebody loves you. You know, God loves you. God never stopped loving. It's a wonderful thing. God never stopped loving any of his wayward child, sure. Right? Right? Uh, this time we got Monica. <laughs> that if we understand that <clears throat> we are all facets of this essence that we call God or the divine or universe, whatever you want to call it, the course calls it, calls it God, and we're not separate, like it's, it's in us, it's us, it's outside us. So, and you understand that everyone Without physical bodies, we're all the same. We're all we're, we're already there. Like there's nowhere to go. We're already there. There's, it's not about becoming someone else. We already are. So when it comes to forgiveness, mm -hmm. if you have that concept within you, you under you're under. There's nothing to forgive because you're 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 not. That doesn't whatever you do, it doesn't change that essence of who you are. So where does the forgiveness come into play then? It comes into play so far as we think that there's something to forgive. You're right that there's nothing to forgive. 
But if I think that there's something to forgive, then what I'm forgiving is myself for thinking that there's something to forgive. <coughs> I'm just letting go of that thought. The, th the thought is there's a problem. There's no problem. But if I thought, if I think that there's a problem, then there's a problem in my mind. So it's just releasing. That's what a miracle is. The miracle is the release. It's the release of that thought. And the other concept that I really have a hard time embracing within the concept of the body being a, a dream, because it is a, it is a dream. But if you are experiencing yourself through spiritual eyes, not physical eyes, then you can use this to express that which you are. Oh, sure. Yes. So within that context, then the body does have a use. Yes. It's it's so the Course is very explicit so about that. Very explicit. Uh, it says the, yeah. And the impulses that we label as wrong, mm -hmm. of course, it's, you say that it's, we start tuning in with what really nourishes us. And the impulses become a miracle. <coughs> Like it's a, a, a spiritual expression of who you are. Mm -hmm. Actually, the phrase that uh, referred to earlier was that miracles are misguided physical impulses. So that's the word misguided. Mm -hmm. right? So the, the impulse of the impulse to love, for example, let's, let's talk about sex for just a second. Um, the impulse, if we're in love, is, then the impulse is that we want to be close. You know, we want to, to embrace. <laughs> That's a perfectly natural impulse. I mean, how could that not be a, a natural impulse? Which is fine and wonderful, especially if we're, we're sharing. Now, if it gets to be selfish, or I'm using the other person, now we're in trouble. Now we're getting guilt into the situation, and it's not a loving situation anymore. But the Course refers to the, to the body as a learning device. It's very important. They're, they're, Four learning devices in the course. There's the body is a learning device. Time is a learning device. So I use my body in time to learn, spiritually speaking, whatever it is that I need to learn so that I can get out of this body. I mean, so I don't have to keep repeating the body thing over and over again so that it can really be free, totally free. And, and so I guess I, that's where the question of how can we Yes. world, it's within, within, that, within that perspective, because it right. becomes a miracle in itself, it becomes just love, and mm -hmm. right. we are enjoying it. Right. Yeah. Sure. It's a high, it's a natural high, it's, it's the highest of highs that there is. Mm -hmm. The highest of highs that there is, is this, this, this natural experience of, of loving, of, 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 of falling.
carved off a little part with a moat and think we've got it going a little bit okay, but if we see pain and chaos and war around us, war is happening to us. And, and then we say, well, how am I creating this when I don't want this? It's because underlying all of it is this tremendous guilt that we're not even aware of, and it is projection. That's why, you know, it says, outside is inside. If I've got anger going on around me, it may not be me seeming angry, but if it's all around me, it's my issue. It's me. It's my projection. And it's for me to heal and undo. And the way I undo it, the way I look at all the horror stories in the news, and I choose to look at it and lift the cover and look at it, the evil of the world, it's undone. You know, a savior must be saved. If you're going to shed light and shine away the shadows, it's got to be a mind full of light looking at them and witnessing to what? Not its reality. Mm -hmm. Belief in equals investment in. And as long as I look out and think I see a sick and sinning brother or someone in distress or somebody wrong or conflict and evil happening and that has power and there's no love and love has no power, I'm investing. I am adding uh, fuel to that fire of evil rules and nothing can be done. And the undoing is when I would be one responsibility of a miracle worker is to accomplish the at one and realize that I'm doing for myself. And literally, I know I'm home in heaven and I can walk this world like a transformer, just shining light into every apparent shadow that comes to my attention because it's all mine. You know, the whole anything that ever comes to my awareness belongs to me. It's happening in my consciousness. And I can shine light into it, but I have to remember what's true. So it is a process of the complete undoing of fear, right. released from anything that ever distressed or hurt us, the belief that anything anywhere could ever suffer. That's no part of God's creation or our reality. And I don't want to keep talking, but I do want to say I feel a tremendous urge that I need to teach. And I want to begin facilitating a class probably here specifically for people who want to be free, who want to have no conflict and no total love, and live uh, without fear and guilt and bringing that awareness to their world, and who are committed to doing and practicing the workbook lessons of the course. Because Jesus says it is by doing these lessons that will precipitate the experience. And it would probably be once a week here. And I would need to know there, if there are enough people committed to doing it that we could at least cover the rental of the room. So if anyone is interested, this folks into the folks here. Thank you so much. It brings up something that, that's really very important, which is Freud said that the purpose of psychotherapy was to make the unconscious conscious. You could say the same thing about a course in miracles. It's no accident that Helen was a brilliant psychologist and understood the process, because Freud was right about understanding the process of the, uh, the dynamics of the ego, that part. He understood the dynamics of the ego and the unconscious and the, and the incredible power that it plays in our lives. So as we make that part of the unconscious conscious, by looking at it, by looking at all the shadow stuff, this younger stuff, and, and by bringing that you don't bring in the course, you do not bring the light to the darkness because you don't know what the light is. <laughs> we do know a lot about what the darkness is because we live in the darkness. So as we bring the darkness to the light, then it, that's the healing, that's, that's how the miracle occurs. So it takes a lot of a willingness on my own part to be very, very aware <coughs> of any time, for example, that I'm being projected, of any of the condemnations that I throw out onto the world. And I, for example, the, the, there's one, the one major addiction that everybody here has, and, and everybody's got it, and maybe in varying degrees, but everybody's got it, is the addiction we all have to judgment. So we, we're addicted to making judgments. It's really almost really very difficult for us to stop the judgmental process. But, you can, but seeing how the Course is about raising our level of awareness, 
I can become I become progressively aware that I'm incredibly judgmental on him. And as I become progressively aware about how incredibly judgmental I am, I, I learn how to stop that. And on another occasion I talked to I think I already about words, or I will do so at another point. Just to watch the words that are coming out of our mouth because our, our, they're always we're always giving ourselves away. And we're damning something or stupid, idiotic, ridiculous, insane, absurd. You just you watch you watch the language. And which when you watch the language you realize that this is projected. It's the like Kim was talking about the authority of the part. You're now playing the role of the authority. You know, the authority is that I know, I'm the judge. I can say, I can call it as it is, I can <laughs> see the problems in the world, I'm really good at it. You know, we're all really good at it, right? Because we've been practicing it all our lives, which is why it's so difficult to stop it, because you've been practicing all your life. That's why the course isn't easy, because it, it takes, it took a long time to get into this mess. So, seeing how the course is about Un undoing, unwinding, unraveling the knots, the blocks inside of my consciousness. But I, I begin to do that. And as I begin to do that, I, that's one of the reasons for the workbook. That's why we have 365 lessons here. That's why it's a slow process. It's a slow process of, of enabling you to see how incredible, projective, and judgmental you are. And then you can begin to stop that, you can begin to let that go, and you can begin to turn the, the whole thing around. Slowly, very slowly. The Course is a very gentle process. It says at one point, I mean, fear not that you will be hurled into reality. Because, <laughs> actually if you were hurled into reality, you wouldn't be able to handle it. It would be so, it would literally be so overwhelming. That's why sometimes when People did have some psychedelic experiences like that. They were, they were literally overwhelming. You know, they just, it was too much. They couldn't, couldn't rock it all. They couldn't take it all. Because the doors of perception, I mean, they were just so open that you didn't even know what to do with all this information that you had. It's all this new kind of perspective that was there for you. So we do it very gently. Sandy? No, Sarah. Uh, stand up, maybe Sarah. Sorry, but uh, and many years project. ago, when you first started the course in America, uh, I don't know, back in the 70s or 80s, but there was something very unique about your approach. And at the same time, Dr. Brian Weiss had written a book. He was, uh, I think, a medical doctor mm -hmm. and on past life regressions. Be more projective. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What I have experienced is three past life experiences in my lifetime. And they came from uh, recovering from a car accident. I thought I was, I saw my life getting ready to go. And I refused to go. And I came home that day and I meditated. And I saw myself in a year and a half in three different countries, three different languages. And I'm just trying to say, is that part of reincarnation or if that's something that's a part of my individual soul that's coming forth now for me to do even something greater or something more meaningful in my life? It's part of your dream. It's a part of your dream. Yeah. Right. But I mean, I've actually seen myself in France on the street. I understand, but it's, it's still part yeah, of the dream. With animals around me. Right. And I saw it in South America, a similar dream. Right. So my question is, is that part of what I'm supposed to be doing in the world? Or is that something I do? I mean, I do it now. Is there something greater out of those things? Well, I mean, to see the, the, what's the part? What, to see the past experiences? Yeah. Yes. It may be, it may, be, it may not be. It, it's not necessary that you do that. On the other hand, maybe it be helpful, or maybe therapeutic that you do that. And part of what it does is enables you to see the, the, the bigger dream. The, the whole kind of dream thing that's been going on. Yeah. So in, in that sense, reincarnation is part of a dream. All, all the, ultimately, there's no reincarnation. A 
the same time that there's no reincarnation, in time, in the illusion, it's true. In time, it's true. Right? Outside of time, eternity, in heaven, not true. There's a very, you know, completely draw line out. It might be very helpful. I think it's one of the most helpful things that you can do is to be, to study your dreams. You know, we should be really attentive to our dreams because it really helps us to understand the stuff that's, that's coming up inside us. Especially when you have a dream that's maybe a disturbing dream to you. And then you kind of wonder, why did that piece of disturbance come up within my dream? Right? For example. Okay. Right. We're going to stop in about three, four minutes. Um, anybody else? Well, then we'll stop now. But, before we stop, two things. One, uh, the last page on the... Um, I, I gave you my business card last time with the uh, Lord's Prayer on the back. And uh, I thought that would say it'd be <coughs> easier and cheaper just to type it than to give away all the cards. <laughs> <coughs> so, after um, the 12 or so people that are going to go to have a, a bite to eat with us, that's at, uh, I think it's 93 University Place, on University, and between 11th and 12th on the university, it's called Saigon Market. I'll be a little bit late getting there because I've got to pack up books and take a bottle of books and stuff like that. Some of us should go on over and save the space. So what we like to do at the end here is to share in saying this, uh, this prayer together. And the way that we do it so that it's not a jumbled mess is that we take a good long we take a pause at each comma and we completely stop at each period. Alright? So, forgive us our illusions, Father, and help us to accept our true relationship with you, in which there are no illusions and where none can ever enter. Our holiness is yours. What can there be in us that needs forgiveness? when the universe is perfect. The sleep of forgetfulness is only the unwillingness to remember your forgiveness and your love. And let us not wander into temptation, for the temptation of some God is not your will. And let us receive only what you have given and accept but this to the minds you created and which you love. Amen. Notice, by the way, we were talking about temptation earlier, how in the last reason, let us not wander into temptation, the temptation of the Son of God. This is really helping us to be really aware of how when temptations come up and what the temptations are. A lot of times we don't even, we're not even aware of them. We just sort of give in right away. Um, there's no conscious thought about the fact that we're temptation. So there's no uh, no class in August. There never will be one in August for these three year sessions. I'll be gone for one thing. And but we will come back again on September, I think it's the thirteenth. And fifteenth. I wrote it down there. Okay, didn't have my glasses on. Um, and we'll do chapter two. We'll do the whole of chapter two. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you.